In your Bibles this morning to Matthew chapter 26, where we will continue our expositions through Matthew. Let's stand together and give our attention to the inspired, infallible, and preserved Word of God. We're going to be reading Matthew 26, verses 26 through 30. Let us give our heart's attention to this blessed word of God. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung in him, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Amen. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Let's continue standing as we lift our hearts together in prayer before the God who loves us. Our great and holy And righteous Father, Thou art all glorious, almighty, all knowing, all present, full of grace, mercy, and love. The angels in heaven the citizens of heaven, shout forth the majesty and the glory of thy holiness. Oh, how we praise thee. Oh, how we thank thee that thou hast gathered us here this morning. Father, through thy Son thou didst tell us That if we, being wicked, know how to give good gifts to our children, how much more the Heavenly Father will give the Holy Spirit to them that ask. I ask thee, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, that thou wouldst manifest thy presence to us and pour out thy Spirit generously in this place. There will be no conversion without thy spirit. There will be no sanctification without thy spirit. There will be no true worship. There will be no hearing thy word without thy spirit. There will be no love for thee. And there will be no love for one another without thy spirit. Come. Come, O Christ. Come, O head of the church. Come, great and glorious and beautiful bridegroom. Come into thy garden and love thy bride here and in every place where thy people are gathering today. Come to this place and make us to know thee. Make us to know thy kisses, O Lord. May heaven kiss earth in this place and in every place that calls on the name of Christ today. Fill us, O God, fill us with that love which casts out fear. Father, John wrote in his epistle, 
truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. Father, O Savior, blessed Savior, whom yet unseen we love, wouldst thou please fellowship with us today. May we know that we have communed with our God. We need thee to come and open our hearts that we may hear and believe thy word and be transformed. Bless all those who have gathered here. May all of us be able to say, I met with the lover of my soul today. Father, there are still many sick in our congregation and we pray in thy mercies that thou wouldst raise them up. And we thank thee for what healings we have experienced. Oh, may we never forget to thank thee that thou didst raise us up from the bed of sickness. Now, O oh God, we want and we, we need, we plead that thou wouldst grant us according to the riches of thy glory to be strengthened with might by thy spirit in the inner man. That we, being rooted and grounded in love, may comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height and to know the love of Christ. Lord, we want Christ to dwell in our hearts by faith. May we know it today, seal it and fill us with thy mighty spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> On the same night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ instituted what we refer to as the Lord's Supper for his disciples. It was the eve of his crucifixion. And his words of institution regarding the bread and the wine were startling, even shocking. Jesus transformed the Passover meal, sacred in the heart of the Jews, making his body and making his blood the focal point of that feast, which has become the holy banquet for his blood-bought churches down through the centuries of their existence. Now in that act, Jesus changed the Jews' history forever. Fulfilled the meaning of the Passover forever. Changed the Jews' covenant forever and gave his people a symbol of the full and free blood-bought salvation that he's given to them by his great grace forever. That unexpected and crucial moment in Christ's life was also a goodbye for now Announcement. Having loved his own, he loved them to the end. And having announced his coming faith, or his coming death, having announced his broken body, having announced his blood poured out. He promised a day of everlasting glory. Everlasting 
joy and everlasting pleasure of drinking wine with his disciples in his Father's everlasting kingdom. That's our promise. Oh, dear people of God, every time we come to that table, we should realize with heartfelt gratitude, with real joy, that it is a symbol and foretaste of our gathering at the marriage supper of the Lamb. If I can put it this way, every time we come to the Lord's table, it's the rehearsal dinner for what's coming. Now, is that the way we think of it? Is that the way we think of the Lord's Supper? Do we look back and see the glory of Christ shedding His blood that we might have everlasting life? Do we commune with Him now do we look forward to every Lord's Supper to communing with Him in a way that's not like any other way? And do we have an eschatological hope, a look forward to that glorious time when we will be with the bridegroom forever? The one who loved us and gave Himself for us. If it's just that thing you happen to do once a, a month because, well, it's expected to you, uh, for you to be there, and it's just, well, a stated meeting. Do yourself the favor and save God the dishonor and don't come. It should be a place of joy. It should be a place of expectation. It should be a time of anticipation of magnifying the Christ who loved you and gave himself for you. Well, in part one of this message, we took up the necessity of the Lord's Supper and asked the question, why should we be so concerned about the Lord's Supper? In answer to that, we took up the first of five answers which have now expanded to six. <clears throat> that one that we considered is this. The Lord Jesus commanded it. If there were no other reason to celebrate the Lord's Supper and to come offering up the praises of our lips, it's the fact that Christ commanded us to do so. The Lord's Supper is therefore a positive ordinance of the head of the church. Do we get that? In America, we usually don't. In America, oh man, we're all for democracy, which the Puritans called, you ready? The devil's government. Because it's mobocracy. It is clear that with a few votes, we can live in all the depravity and perversion that we want to. And when you convince the majority to vote wickedness, they will. And that's what you'll live in with your democracy. We don't get that Jesus is the Lord. And one of the primary ways of understanding the New Testament today is that, well, Jesus, uh, He's your Savior. But if you Want to let Him be your Lord, you can, and you can do it any time. That is error. Yeah. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord, Jesus Christ. That means He's the boss. That means He tells us every day what to do. Every day. And you know what? Those that have a new heart love to have it so. They love. Tell me what to do. How do you want me to live? That's my desire. 
that's not your desire, you're not a Christian. One of the first things those that have been born of God's Spirit recognize is that Jesus isn't my buddy. Jesus isn't just my pal, my running friend. Now, he's the friend of sinners, no doubt. But he is the awesome, sovereign God of the universe. He loves his people. He saves them from their sins. And he rules them. As the prophet of God, he illuminates them. As the priest of God, he has offered the once for all sacrifice and now intercedes for us. And as the king, he governs us. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. The Lord Jesus Christ. So, the Lord's Supper is not simply, as we've said before, part of the accessory, part of the furniture of being a Christian. It is a command of the gracious, merciful, loving head of the church. It is therefore to be sought with joy, submitted to, submitted to with gladness. It's not a suggestion. It's not an option. And it's certainly not a personal preference. It's the command of the one who loved us, broke the bread, passed around the cup, and gave himself for our everlasting life. So this sermon is entitled, This is my body, this is my blood, part two. And may our gracious and merciful, and loving Heavenly Father, ravish our hearts with His eternal love in Jesus Christ. And that by the holy force of His Spirit. If I can stir up your flesh, it'll go away. But if the Spirit of God moves, you will know that you've met with your God. We want, as the temple of the Holy Spirit, to know the presence of that holy person. Well, we return then to the idea of the necessity of the Lord's Supper. We've considered the first reason for that necessity. Therefore, number two, the Lord's Supper is a primary ordinance of worship. It is necessary because it is a primary, not secondary, not something set on the back burner. It is a primary ordinance of worship. The Spirit-inspired, infallible, and preserve scriptures of the New Testament make clear that Jesus gave His church two ordinances, baptism and the Lord's Supper. While some denominations add a third, foot washing, Christ's churches as a whole have not been persuaded that it is an ordinance, though it is a humbling and beautiful practice. Our confession summarizes the biblical data this way. Baptism and the Lord's Supper are ordinances of positive and sovereign institution. Appointed by the Lord Jesus, the only lawgiver, to be continued in His church to the end of the world.
As we have considered previously, the Lord's Supper is probably the most neglected ordinance and means of grace in Christ's holy, Bible-governed worship. In America, people get excited and thrilled about and would never miss Christmas and Easter, which Christ has not commanded. Not a word. Yet, they can take or leave the Lord's Supper, which He has commanded and has given us clear instruction. What does that tell you about our religion? What does that tell you? Something that Christ has commanded us to do until He returns. Relegated, if not entirely neglected, to maybe once in a while. And it's no big deal. People kind of show up if they want to. Now, you'd never do that with Christmas. You'd never say, you know what? We're just going to go fishing today. Forget all that. In fact, you know, for the next couple of years, we don't need to do it. We've, we've done it before, so we'll just kind of wait a couple of years and do it again. Never happens. And there's a reason. Because it's rooted in the flesh, not the scriptures. Now that should cause God's people to examine their hearts. Why is it and how is it that we often grip with a death grip things that God's never commanded us to do, or to think, or say. And yet things that He has commanded us are neglected or even rejected. Why is that? Idolatry comes natural to us. Spiritual things do not. Now, do you believe that? Is your worship dead, dry, boring? Maybe the, the pastor's fault. But I'll tell you what. The most stuttering and inept preacher who's filled with the Holy Ghost and preaches the Word can satisfy the longings of hungry souls. Brethren, Calvin was right when he said that we are, by nature, idle factories. Our hearts are idle factories. We will immediately lay hold of things that are somebody's good idea. The church of Jesus Christ is drowning in fleshly good ideas. Instead of what the Word of God plainly commands us to do. Now I understand and I agree with the fact that we can take the Word of God, we can look at particular principles, and we can make decisions and do certain things within the church that seem reasonable according to the overall tenor of Scripture. problem is we very readily lay hold of and then we'll never let go of those little institutions that we've made not that God has commanded but that we've made and everything about his worship listen carefully everything about his worship must be done in the power of the Holy Spirit. He is not interested in half-hearted singing. He just isn't. Oh yeah, I don't learn any of the hymns. For God's worship 
but I listen to all kind of stuff all week that I just want to listen to, and, and I don't listen to any of the things that I should be singing with my brothers and sisters. Do you not see something wrong with that? That's good American religion. I've met. That's right at the top. But it's lousy Christianity. It's not all about you and what tickles your fancy. It is about coming together with God's people and lifting up our voices. Brethren, one of the important things that we should do is to lift our heart with songs that go back hundreds, maybe even thousands of years, because we are one with all those who went before us. We are God's people. We're not here to do something new. We're here to do something old. And unfortunately, the Lord's Supper is one of those things that just isn't really on the radar screen for most Christians. It's just, you just do that thing. And that's a tragedy. It is a means of grace that God has given us by which we may fellowship with Him. <sighs> to minimize or neglect the Lord's Supper is to minimize or neglect Christ's command and His worship. That is no small crime against heaven. And, and most of us don't think in those terms because most of us, let's just be honest, most of us don't think in terms of worship. It's something we do, not the heart of life. It's not the most important thing in our world. Nevertheless, the Lord's Supper is the ordinance that Jesus gave to His church on the eve of His fulfilling the eternal purpose of redemption, of accomplishing the everlasting salvation of sinners such as you and I, and His securing their presence with Him in the realms of eternal glory. Well, oh, I can take that and leave it. We'll pass on it this month. See you another time. So before we proceed, we need to take a few minutes and consider some terminology. Because the next few weeks, you're going to have to know this terminology to understand clearly some of the things that have happened to the Lord's Supper through the course of the ages. I hope, God willing, next week to begin... If I don't get through part two, I hope to begin uh, looking at the early church, what it thought about the Lord's Supper, and then how that changed down through the centuries. And you will see, very often it's because of men's good idea. I got an idea. Why don't we do this? Why don't we think of it this way? Why don't we look at it that way? Brethren, one of the reasons we think like that is because of the fallenness of our flesh. And the second reason that we do is because of the ignorance of God's Word. We believe and we think that the Scriptures are very clear about this. God is not to be worshipped in any other way than His Word requires. Period. The rest is idolatry. Now that's sobering. If that's the case, what does that say about American Jesus and American religion? What do we see constantly? Turn on your television, get on the internet, or maybe not, or turn on the radio. And what are you going to hear? There's some good men that, that preach the word of God, preach Christ boldly. But you hear a whole lot of men's good ideas. And those things fill up the church of Christ. And you know what? They satisfy goats, religious goats. But they don't satisfy those who have been born of God's Spirit. God's people want Christ. They want to be fed the Word of God. 
They want their lives transformed. They want to be like the Savior. They want to be with the Savior. They want to worship the Savior. They want to obey the Savior. So, let's consider the next few terms. I've put the notes on the outline so you can just listen. Because sometimes when we get to writing, we miss what's being said. For this, you need to learn this terminology. It'll be important for the next few weeks. Number one, what does the word ordinance mean? In a theological context, it means something that God has ordained. Something God the Father or Christ the Son has commanded us to do. That's an ordinance. In our day, Baptists and others generally use the word ordinance for baptism and the Lord's Supper. So an ordinance. Is that clear? Christ, the head of the church, has commanded us to do it. That needs to be in our thinking. Number two, what is a sacrament? Uh Uh-oh, in a lot of people's minds, fire alarms just went off, flags went up, maybe even some fireworks. What is a sacrament? Well, many professing Christians immediately think of Roman Catholicism, Greek Orthodoxy, Anglicanism, Lutheranism, and Methodism when they hear the word sacrament. That's fighting words in some places, or fighting word. Interesting thing about history. The concept of sacrament arose from the Greek word Mysterion, mysterion, which means mystery, a mystery. The Bible talks about mysteries. Mysterion was then translated into the Latin sacramentum, because in the West, Latin became the language of theology. So mysterion, mystery, simply went over into the Latin as sacramentum. Now, what is sacramentum? What is a mysterium? Well, it originally was a Latin term for a soldier's... um, Oh, wait, no. Let me back up. Mysterion is Greek. Latin is sacramentum. I think I just crossed those up. That is classical Latin for a soldier's oath of allegiance. And we still have oaths of allegiance for military men. It was an oath of a soldier's allegiance accompanied with the symbol of a tattoo. The soldiers would have a tattoo. And that insignia on their body spoke of their allegiance to the the nation for whom they fought. So from this, the idea of sacrament came to be known as a sign of a holy thing. A sign. It represents something. Sign of a holy thing. Or it could mean the visible sign of an invisible grace. The visible sign of an invisible grace. Well, that's exactly what the Lord's Supper is. It's a visible sign of an invisible grace. Here's the rub. Roman Catholicism teaches that a sacrament gives grace ex opere operato. Now, I usually don't use Latin or Greek or Hebrew words in sermons, but you will hear this once you begin to study in any depth the issue of the ordinances or sacraments. Now, what does ex opere operato mean? Literally, it means by the work performed. By the work performed. That means the sacrament channels God's grace automatically. 
without faith, without repentance in the person who receives it. Now that's why Protestants and Baptists of every stripe generally uh, throw away the word sacrament because they hear Rome's error and they throw the word out. The word is still a usable word. You have to be careful where you use it and how you define it. But the fact of the matter is, Rome believes that with baptism, the priest sprinkles the baby and the baby is regenerated, born again. Doesn't matter whether the, the baby obviously doesn't have faith, obviously doesn't repent and believe, but it doesn't matter because the work brings in the efficacious grace of God simply by the act. Everybody understand that? In other words, it's like magic. We say the incantation and then the power happens. It's the same thing with the Lord's Supper. When, when the priest says the prayer and uses the words of institution, it changes the bread and the wine into the body and blood of Christ. And when you give it to anybody, the grace is automatically theirs, whether they believe or not. Ex opera operato. It has to be a duly ordained priest, but he has the power in both of those matters. Well, of course, we don't believe that. We cannot substantiate that from a single scripture in the Bible. Not in those terms. Now, it may shock some to know that... 17th and 18th century Baptists used the term sacraments. Commonly. But not in the way Rome uses it. For instance, in Hercules Collins, that's a great name. Collins family, if you're looking for the next baby. Hercules Collins. This is a great name. Hercules Collins and Orthodox Catechism. Question 65. We read, what are the sacraments? This is Baptist literature. What are the sacraments? They are sacred signs and seals. Now a seal means a, a confirmation. Something that confirms something. <clears throat> that they are signs and they are seals set before our eyes and ordained of God for this cause, that he may declare and seal them or confirm believers by them the promise of his gospel unto us. And what is that promise? To wit, that he giveth freely remission of sins and life everlasting to every one in particular that believeth. When we sit down for the Lord's Supper, we're seeing the gospel in bread and wine. The broken body of Christ, the shed blood for Christ, the substitutionary death of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the promise of the gospel is that those who repent and believe will have everlasting life. So we have a glorious seal, a confirmation to all of those who come as repentant sinners to that table. That that salvation is ours. And every time we see it, every time we do it, it is a reminder of Christ's glorious death and resurrection. It is a glorious reminder that He loved me before the foundation of the world. A glorious reminder that He loves me now. It is a glorious reminder that He lo will love us forever. Will love me forever. That is what God's people can see every time they look at that bread and that cup. With faith. With faith. It is by faith alone. Rome believes that its priests have the power. We say no. It is the Spirit of God that has the power. And that the Lord's Supper 
and that baptism in whatever form it comes doesn't just have grace in it for anybody that goes in or out of the, the water or who takes the bread or the cup. Well, uh, Collins, by the way, signed the 1689 Second London Baptist Confession. That is why our confession reads the way it does in that beautiful chapter on the Lord's Supper. I urge you to read it frequently and ask questions. Know it, because that's good preparation for the Lord's Supper. Coming to something that you know about. Well, likewise, Nehemiah Cox's a sermon preached at the ordination of an elder and deacons in a baptized congregation. It's a good title. He speaks of the administration, quote, the administration of the sacraments or ordinances of positive institution in the church. The positive institution is the fact that Jesus Christ commanded them. That's what it means. Positive institution. And what do we see there? Notice, he uses these words as synonyms, sacraments and ordinances, or ordinances. Christ's command, my dear brethren, matters. So ordinance points to origin. Ordinance points to, or, to origin. It is Christ's command. And sacrament po points to function. The Holy Spirit bestowing grace. The Holy Spirit bestowing grace. So then, <clears throat> number three, what do we mean by the term means of grace? Now, that's an unusual term for most people today. Those uh, in Reformed congregations generally are familiar with the term, but uh, not so much as they once were. And what do we mean by that? Uh, for this, we need a few minutes of focused thought. Everybody ready? Focused thought, not religious daydreaming, or maybe even non-religious daydreaming. We need to, th to focus in here. The means of grace... It, that is not a biblical term. You won't find it in the Bible. Not there. But that's like many other terms of things we see in the Bible, but there's, the word doesn't exist. The word Trinity is nowhere in the Bible. But there's, there's a person called the Father, and he's worshipped as God. There's someone called the Son, and he's worshipped as God. There's someone who is called the Holy Spirit, and is worshipped as God, and yet the Bible tells us there's one God. It tells us that in very plain language. So the Bible is either hopelessly confused, or we have to try to understand what that means. And that's where we get the term tri-unity. Within the nature of the one God, there are three eternal purpose, uh, persons. It's the same thing with the word millennium. It's on the lips of almost all modern Christians. And yet, the word doesn't exist anywhere in the scriptures. It's not there. But there is a period of Christ's reign that all, regardless of their millennial view, believe in. There is a reign of Christ. Whether it's amill, post-mill, pre-mill, dispensational, it's all about a millennium. The word's not there. So when we see something like the means of grace, we shouldn't immediately run away from it. We need to prove it. We need to test it and make sure that it's biblical. Now stay with me for just a few moments because you'll begin to see why this is important. <clears throat> means of grace is often an imprecise or unclear term because different denominations use it in different ways. Same thing as with the word sacrament. <clears throat> But early Baptists used the term to mean that Christ, our Lord, has means by which He communicates, by which He channels, by which He bestows 
the benefits of his great salvation upon his people. And it is a great salvation. So we call those channels the means of grace. In fact, we might even call them just the channels of Christ's love. To grasp this idea better, let's consider first the word means. We may define it as the instrument by which something is accomplished. The way something is brought about. For example, consider driving a nail into a piece of wood. Right? You can do it with a screwdriver. But it's not a lot of fun. It's not a great way to do it. But using a hammer to drive that nail would, would be the means by which we drive the nail into a piece of wood. That's the way it's accomplished. It's a tool. It's an instrument. It's a means. So, now let's consider the word grace. Grace has several meanings in Scripture. In the broad sense, God's grace is His unmerited favor. You've probably heard that definition. That is, He freely bestows His favor on someone because He chooses to do so. Not because the person has earned it. Crucial that you understand that. We see this in the Sermon on the Mount. Speaking of His Holy Father in heaven, Jesus said, For He, God, maketh His Son to rise on the evil and on the good. Now the evil don't deserve that sunshine. They deserve nothing but rank darkness. Blinding darkness. God chooses to show mercy to the wicked. They don't deserve that blessing. Same thing with rain. The lost farmer knows the blessing of God in a rain. Just like the saved farmer. God has shown grace to both of them. Neither one of them earned it. But God in His mercy shows that grace. <clears throat> now secondly, there's a narrow sense. There's a narrow sense. In that, grace is the predestination, the election, the regeneration, the justification, the sanctification, the glorification of a sinner in Jesus Christ. Paul helps us to understand what that means in Romans chapter 11. Paul had been talking about salvation for the Gentiles. So in verse 1, Paul asked the question, Hath God cast away His people? By His people, He means the Jews. Since you're talking, Paul, about the, the, the Gentiles being grafted in, well, has God thrown away His people? Paul says, God forbid. May it never be. The Greek literally means may it never be. When the King James translators did uh, their wonderful work, they wanted to use a term that would convey something that will never happen. And the strongest way that they could say it was God forbid. <clears throat> so Paul the Jew then uses himself as an example, for I also am an Israelite. I'm a Jew. The seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. Next he qualifies what he means. God hath not cast away his people which he foreknew. There's a qualification there. He includes himself in that number. And he's talking about predestination and election. He follows this in verse 5 and 6 saying, At this present time also there is a remnant, that's believing Jews, according to the election of grace. And if by grace, then it is no more of works. 
Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then is it no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. Now, it sounds like double talk at first. But if you read it, he's making a crucial point. It's a very simple point, but it's absolutely vital that every human being understand what he's talking about especially those who profess to be his people. In other words, if God elects a person because of his works, then his election has been earned. If God elects a person by grace, then his election is not earned. God has simply freely chosen to do so. So in that context, work means earning God's favor. And grace means God freely choosing without any consideration of merit. Without any consideration of works. Now, the next thought is crucial to all of this. God can only deal with sinful humanity on the basis of of grace in Jesus Christ. It's the only way. He's holy. Men are sinful. How does God deal with sinful people? He cannot do so other than through the Lord Jesus Christ. For all humanity has earned nothing but God's judgment. The wages of sin is Death. The wages of sin is death. With that in mind, all grace comes to sinners by Jesus Christ, the mediator. The one mediator between God and man. Now that's what we would call objective grace. Stay with me, this is almost over. Not the sermon, the point. This is objective grace. And that is a grace outside of us. When we say something's objective, it's not in us, it's outside of us. So God in His mercy chose to show grace to us. But we don't know that, right? When we read the scriptures, we don't, we don't, we don't know that other than through Jesus Christ. When we read the scripture, we hear about the grace of God. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ according as He hath chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to Himself according to the good pleasure of His will. To the praise of the glory of His grace, wherein He hath made us acceptable, accepted in the Beloved. Now, if you're with me, <clears throat> we're just about there. So how does that grace get to God's people? How does that grace get to God's people? Objective grace is outside us. So how does it come to us? How does it come to us? Can't go to the store and buy it. Certainly can't work for it. How does that grace come to us? Through the power of the Holy Spirit. That's how it comes to us. Now... Please stay with me for just a few more moments here. When the Spirit works in our hearts, grace becomes subjective. It's objective. It's all in Christ. It's all in God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But how does it get to us? How does it become something that transforms us? God sends His Holy Spirit. His Spirit ministers to our hearts. And that is the grace of God. 
We live in a day where we hear believers say, we've all done it, not jumping on anybody, but I am trying to fine tune us. <clears throat> well, I need more grace today. You ever said something like that? Oh, I need a lot of grace. Need grace today. Need the Lord's grace. Now, what, what's going on in your mind when you say that? When we hear many Christians talking that way, they talk about grace as if it were stuff. It's like stuff. I need more grace, like something you can measure. I need a gallon and a half of grace today. Right? It's like, fuel, it's like a <laughs> gasoline for my car. What is grace? It is the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. That's what you need today. When you're facing that trouble tomorrow, when you're facing something at work, when you're facing a tragedy in your family, when your health collapses and you're thinking, well, maybe I'm on my deathbed. What do you need? Well, we go, more grace. What do you mean by that? I need the Holy Spirit. I need greater power of the Holy Spirit moving in my mind, in my heart, in my body. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Grace is not stuff. When you leave today, I hope you at least remember that. It's not the most important part of the sermon. <laughs> but grace is not stuff. It is the active power of God in your life through the Holy Spirit. In the context that we've just read, it's grace is the power of the Holy Spirit working in the hearts of God's regenerate people. He gives them strength for the day. How did you make it through that rough day? How did you make it? Through the power of God's Spirit. It wasn't because you were tough. He gives them gifts by which to serve and honor Christ. Motivation. Motivation. To serve Christ. Repentance from. And mortification of their sins. If you ever repent. I mean real repent. The way the Bible speaks of it. There's only one reason. Because the Holy Spirit. Is operative in your soul. It isn't stuff that you get. That helps you. It is the person of the Holy Spirit. That moves in your heart to hate that sin. To learn how to motivate. And to learn how to mortify. All these things come from the Spirit of God. That is God's goodness poured out upon you. Filling you. Why in the world would you love Jesus? Why in the world would you walk away from popularity? Why in the world would you walk away from your friends? Why would you walk away from your job? Oh, is it because you're wonderful? It's because the Holy Spirit in grace moves in your heart. And we need more of that every day. Every day we're absolutely dependent upon the Holy Spirit. And that is why we need to be praying Monday through Saturday that God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, will meet with us every Lord's Day. If we just kind of come in and wait for the pastor to crank me up, forget it! I might be able to stir your flesh, like I said a while ago, but I cannot move your heart to do what you do out of love for Christ. You must be born again. And that's the Holy Spirit's work. You don't have a button that goes, okay, make the Holy Spirit do something. Not there. It is the grace of God. There's objective grace. There's subjective grace. All the objective grace in God. It's in the Spirit. It's all in Christ. And it comes to us through the channel, the means of the Holy Spirit. Now, if you're with me, that Spirit comes and gives us understanding in the Scriptures. Why is it that you didn't really have an interest in the Scriptures? 
And then there was a day that came when you, it was, it was like a magnet drawing you. You needed to come to the Word of God. You wanted to hear from your God. Was it because you got better? It's because the Spirit of God that wrote the Scriptures moved in your heart to seek Him in the Scriptures. To seek Christ in the Scriptures. To seek your God in the Scriptures. Grace is not stuff. It's not stuff. It's the personal work of the Holy Spirit in our souls. Why in the world do you want to serve the living Christ? Well, this is wonderfully given to us, my dear friends. This is wonderfully given to us in the Baptist Catechism. Now, this is going to sound like Baptist history, no doubt. It's sometimes called Keech's Catechism. And it's sometimes called Spurgeon's Catechism. And it was probably compiled by William Collins, Hercules' brother. So whoever put it together, we think it was William Collins. Question 93 is very helpful here. What does it say? What are the outward means, the means, what are the outward means whereby Christ communicateth to us the benefits of redemption? And he answers, the outward and ordinary means whereby Christ communicateth to us the benefits of redemption are his, are you ready? His ordinances. His ordinances. Oh, somebody's getting baptized? I don't need to be there for that. You know, they'll, they'll have a happy time. You ought to be right there looking at what Christ has done looking at the miracle of raising someone from the dead and now giving us a beautiful picture of it as they disappear under the water rising again to the newness of life a miracle of God you can take that and leave it really really no this is where we come and we feast and we say I remember a day I remember a day when God came to me in my darkness and he opened my eyes and he showed me my sinfulness. And he showed me the blessings of the Savior. He showed me that Jesus Christ was willing to save sinners. And I qualified. And so do you. And he opened my heart and raised me from the dead. And I, I put that before everybody. When the pastor took me and put me under the water and raised me up. And we're saying, I was, I was dead. I'm now alive. I was going that way. Now I'm going this way after Christ. These are important means of grace. Of God's blessing us. When we stood here just a couple of months ago and baptized three young women, I, I heard people say to me, and I, I thought it was great, you got out preached today. Amen. Because we were obeying God in the waters of baptism. And it was a greater sermon than any human being can preach. It is a miracle of God. You see, this whole idea of man's will has robbed glory. God's glory. Oh, I did it. I let God do it when I was ready. Yes, sir. I let Jesus save me. I finally let Jesus come into my heart. Man, I'm going to tell you what. That has filled the buildings on this planet called churches with goats that have no love for Christ, no hunger for the Scriptures, no desire for the ordinances. But it fills people's head with the thought that I'm okay with God because I've done the religious thing now. They are twice fold the children of hell. Is the Lord's Supper important? Is baptism important? The Lord gave us those ordinances to magnify His glory 
in the salvation of sinners such as you and I. Yeah, well, I'd be glad if somebody came to my baptism, but, you know, I may not show up for somebody else's. What is the matter with us? We're full of American religion and the stinking corrupt flesh that loves itself. But when our hearts and minds get right with God, we begin to realize He gives us means of grace by which He downloads, if I can put it that way, He downloads the grace of God into our souls by the mighty power of the Spirit. We need to be praying daily that we don't grieve that Holy One by which we serve the Lord Jesus, by which we make it through the day, by which we can come and worship. Oh, my dear brethren, the Lord has given us this beautiful catechism goes on and says He's given us His ordinances Especially, listen carefully, the word, not plays, not dances, the word, the preaching and reading of the word. The Lord Jesus looked at his disciples after telling everyone they needed to eat, eat his flesh and drink his blood. He, by today's standards, Jesus wasn't a good preacher boy. Because he let all the fish get away. They said, how can this guy give us his bread, his flesh to eat? And Jesus said, oh, let's ratchet this up a little bit more. If you don't eat my flesh and drink my blood, there is no life in you. Who is he saying this to? God's people, the Jews. Who would soon crucify their Savior. Let me say to you, brethren. This is astonishing. Jesus turns around to his disciples and he says, you know what, guys? Maybe I was a little rough on these fellows. You know, I, I guess I wasn't winsome enough. I guess maybe I was a little too hard on them. Would you forgive me for that? I really didn't mean to say all that stuff about eating my flesh and drinking my blood. Jesus turned around and looked at his hand-picked disciples and said, are you going to leave too? And what did Peter say? You have the words of life. What would we go? Where would we go? You have the words of life. We ought to be coming to the congregation because we want to hear from God, not from that weak and feeble vessel of dust that does what he can to deliver it. I'm not here for a grading scale. I'm here to deliver the word of God. God's already spoken. That's, his mean, that's one of his means of grace. It's one of the ways. It is the way sinners get saved. If you want to use that terminology, the very power of the word of God is made real in their minds, real in their hearts. And they believe that Jesus Christ is who he said he is. They believe that he is the God-man. They believe that he was crucified. They believe that he rose again the third day. They believe that he ascended into glory and that he is the Lord of life. They believe that. The word, baptism, the Lord's Supper and prayer, all which means are made effectual to the elect for salvation. God uses these instruments, these ways of bringing His grace to your heart. Why would you neglect them? So why would we neglect the Lord's Supper? Catch it again sometime. Maybe not. Brethren, those who are thinking biblically realize they want all those opportunities that God gives them to grow and be strengthened and to be confirmed in their faith. When you come, oh my brethren, when you come to that table, you see the symbols of Christ, glorious body broken. Why? God poured out all his fury on him so that he could show you grace 
and mercy and peace. When we take that cup, oh, we see the blood. That's gory. That's a gross thought. Drinking blood. Ooh, that sounds like vampires. It's what our Savior said. My life was poured out for yours. Richard Barcellus defines means of grace as the delivery systems God has instituted to bring grace. That is spiritual power, spiritual change, spiritual help, spiritual fortitude, spiritual blessings to needy souls on earth. Now, if I've just described things that you need, wouldn't you want to lay hold of every one of the means of grace that you possibly could? Which ones do you want to leave out? But we have to quit. We didn't even get to number three. Well, friends, there's nothing more important in this world than worship. Christ's worship is what we are saved for. And we want to gather together and magnify him, sing to him, pray to him, and to do it as one body. And to look around the room and say, you know what? I love these people because Jesus loves them. Yeah, we don't all think exactly the same way, but the Lord put me among these people and I'm going to love them as much as I can love them. Don't just come and go, ah, bread, yeah, a cup of grape juice, all right, yeah. Amen, praise God from whom all. Come and see the glories of salvation set before your eyes by Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Father, we thank thee for thy grace and mercy. We desperately need thee every minute, every day, every hour. Oh, how we need thee. Come, oh God, and help us. Help us. Help us to love thee. And we can't force ourselves into it. We can't even beat ourselves into it. We need to look in thy word and see those precious words. In love having predestinated us into the adoption of children. That we are thy children because of God's love. And that grace comes to us by word and spirit. Now, help us to think on these things as next week we will gather together for thy supper. Oh, may we come with a renewed desire for it, a new hunger for it, a new desire to commune with our Christ. We pray it all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's stand. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling. Unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. With exceeding joy. To the only wise God our Savior be glory and majesty, dominion and power both now and ever. Amen. Amen. Let's go in the name of the Savior.